Welcome to this America's Week evening lecture about Claire Sheridan, the artist, writer and journalist, and her trip to the US and Canada in 1937. My main source for the lecture has been the book Redskin Interlude, which she published in 1938. Even from the title, you can appreciate that even from the title, you can appreciate that her attitudes, values and language are very different from our own. So I wanted to start with a disclaimer. I have included passages from her book as she wrote them. Although some of the words she uses and the attitudes she reveals feel extremely uncomfortable in the present, they were considered still has value because of the information within it. Claire Sheridan was no stranger to adventure by the time she set off on her trip to, as she called it, find pre-white man America in 1937. She was born into an aristocratic family and grew up with all the advantages of a member with all the advantages of a member of the upper classes, except the money. She married young and had three children, but lost her daughter Elizabeth to tuberculosis in 1914 and her husband Wilfred to a German sniper the following year. After a relatively conventional early adulthood, Claire embraced a more number of lovers, a brief enthusiasm for communism, and an evolving career in journalism, writing and sculpture. Her profile as an artist, and fears about her political leanings, grew when she travelled to Russia and sculpted busts of party notables, including Lenin and Trotsky. In 19 notables, including Lenin and Trotsky. In 1925, she moved to Turkey and then Algeria, where she built a house in Biskra, on the edge of the Sahara. She lived there with her children until 1937, when her son Richard died from appendicitis. With a need for solace, fresh subjects, she embarked on her next journey, sailing to New York. Claire had been told by a friend about a summer art colony, encamped by a glacier lake somewhere in the Rocky Mountains, which specialised in using Native American models. Time spent at the colony would give her the chance to create new work, the chance to create new work with new models in a new environment. It would mean crossing America from New York to the Rocky Mountains, a journey she decided to do alone by car. Friends had journeyed by train, but she could find no one who had done what she planned to do, and she had limited information to guide her. I consulted my father's autobiography, in which he described his ranching days in Wyoming. That was about 1879 to 1885. He'd seen the great buffalo herds and had known the Indians on the warpath and met, actually met, Sitting Bull. In those days, there were no roads or railways existent. My father's book was interesting, but of no practical value. Having stopped to collect a letter of introduction from the Indian Department in Washington, Claire now faced a drive of 2,429 miles. It is a very curious sensation to motor day after day alone, seeing things you cannot seeing things you cannot discuss, bottling up your feelings, and wondering where you'll spend the coming night. The roads were so straight, so straight and so long that they seemed to lead to eternity. As there was nothing to arrest my eye, my thoughts wandered hopelessly, and at times I forgot where I was or that I was driving a car. As she approaches her first reservation, Rosebud, she records the first of many musings about the plight of Native American peoples which must have made uncomfortable reading for any Americans who bought her book. They were nowhere to be seen, these real Americans, the hundred percenters. They were hidden away on no part in the life of their own country. If the white man had been generous in allotting acreage, he had carefully selected its quality. If the reservation prairie land looks more or less habitable, you may be sure that it is in a climate where there is only one harvest in six years. It is land, in other words, that is not covered, coveted by whites. And all the while I was driving my car, hour after hour across this vast expanse, I wondered why there wasn't room enough for both whites and reds. It seemed so sparsely inhabited. There were so few flocks, so little cattle. Why did the white man push back the red man if, having cleared him off, cleared him off the land, he did nothing with that land? She goes on. At last I came to the famous Badlands, a detour off the main road took me through this strange country of soft rock, corroded by rain and wind into fantastic shapes. 
Hills crowned with imaginary castles and cathedrals and cathedrals. It is bleak and sinister and there's no vegetation. With what's becoming a familiar, unimpressed tone, she records her opinion of the work underway at Mount Rushmore. Although George Washington's nose is 21 foot long, his mouth 18 feet wide, and his whole head from chin to crown feet, it looks small. It would have been worthwhile to have left the other heads, Lincoln, Jefferson and Roosevelt, and to have made Washington four times bigger. Claire was very aware of how much had changed since her father's time in the States. The next day, June the 13th, I reached Buffalo. The next day, June the 13th, I reached Buffalo. If I record this journey day by day, it is with the hope of conveying an idea of distance that separates east from west. It would be so much simpler to say I landed in New York and drove to Montana. But that drive to Montana was a gradual, very gradual, I was thinking and acquiring much along the way. For one thing, I was following the track of the pioneers. Barely fifty years ago, this west towards which I was heading was unknown, except to a few missionaries and French trappers. And historically, fifty years is a very short time. Claire stops at Dude Ranch, where she was branching westward across America. Ranching is all the rage for Easterners. They come from New York and such like places, the rich and the spoilt, to spend a summer living the simple life. Each dude had a cabin and met in a communal hunting lodge for meals. We watched them choose their favourite horse from the in a communal hunting lodge for meals. We watched them choose their favourite horse from the corral. A grand cavalcade with cowboy escort started up the mountain slope. Mrs. Belden in chaps and a waistcoat of a piebald cow rode the most fiery, the most truculent of all the horses. It reared and butted with the utmost composure. In Yellowstone Park, she is entranced by the forests, the remoteness, and the wildlife. Bears are to be found in quantities all along the roads waiting for cars, which always stop and always give them food. Bears have uncertain moods, uncertain moods. Maybe they feel the same thing about humans, of whom there are a great variety. Two hundred or more tourists, it's officially stated, are taken to hospital every year from Yellowstone Park, suffering from bear bites or cloyings. These folk belong to the category that Americans would call dumb. Young bears, a few months old, were extremely friendly. They would eat out of one's hand and one stood up and put his paws against my chest, straining towards the piece of bread I held aloft. There were little bears that had the effrontery to climb onto the running boards of cars and even on the bonnet. The grown-ups were uncertain but I was able to get several slithers and babies. Before a bear runs at you she gives a kind of snorting sneeze, so that while you're looking into the finder trying to adjust your picture, if you hear that sneeze you just run for it. They don't pursue, so long as you can dodge around the car you're perfectly safe. Hans Reese said he had never seen anyone move as quickly as I did occasion when I heard a sneeze. Eventually Claire made it to the art colony at St Mary's Lakes in Glacier National Park, but almost immediately drove away again to Browning, where the Blackfeet were preparing their Sundance Festival. She was greeted warmly and offered a house to stay in for all eight days of the event, eight days of the event, by the government agent for the reservation. By spending all day, every day, at the camp, not only did I begin to know faces, but the Indians began to recognise me as a familiar figure. Anyone who spent so much time among them could not be regarded as a mere tourist. Tourists never stayed, tourists never stayed long, just long enough to do some kodaking or to watch a dance, but I had evidently come to stay. The first time I received a salutation, I felt I had really begun to make an impression. There were two or three teepees close together whose owners invited me inside and made me welcome. Fish. No one who went to the camp could fail to notice Turtle. He was a monumental Indian, more like the gnarled root of a tree. His hands were big and powerful, and he was powerfully built, of no recognisable age, and endowed with unusual strength. It was well known that he had wrestled with a gri it was well known that he had wrestled with a grizzly and won. He wore the bear's claws as a necklace with a big turquoise blue bead in between each, his most treasured possession. I was fascinated by Turtle. I had my heart set on modelling him, 
I must do turtle if I never did anybody else. He refused to pose for the usual 50 cents, but consented for two dollars an hour. I so wanted him to like me, to like being modelled by me. One night, when I was invited to dance around a fire in the tent of a chief, Turtle, with a perfectly serious face, chucked me under the chin. I think familiarity on the part of an Indian, especially of Turtle, was extremely surprising. Claire developed friendships with a number of individuals during the festival, including Last Rider, chief of the Brave Dog Society, his wife Sings in the Water, and his nephew Lone Wolf. It was from, it was from Lone Wolf that I learned what not to do when entering a teepee. For instance, inside a lodge one has to take in at a glance the presence of the medicine bundle. Usually it hangs above the owner's head, and the owner's official place is opposite the entrance. A visitor entering the lodge may walk around the fire to greet his host, and having greeted him, must on no account pass in front of him, for he must not cross the medicine bundle. Nor is it courteous to pass between a man who is smoking and the fire. She says, That Sundance camp became essentially part of my life. Faces grew so familiar that I no longer felt life. Faces grew so familiar that I no longer felt a stranger. Indeed, I was no longer treated as a stranger. Last rider invited me to stay in his teepee. The moonlight was filtering through the opening in the top and I lay looking up at the stars, conscious of all the vertical poles that converged on that opening. The canvas end is attached to a pole, which enables one to fold it back, or in the case of rain, close the opening. These ears flapped softly in the wind, making a soothing sound like the sails of a ship. The next morning, Last Rider made an announcement. It had been decided that Claire would be taken into the tribe and, give, and the ceremony would take place the same day. A good many tourists had been attracted by the drumming and it was an intimidating moment when I stepped out of the painted lodge, led by my feathered sponsor. There was first of all a good deal of dancing, chiefly by the grass dancers. When the grass dance was over, Luddy came forward and invited me to dance the owl dance. It's not unlike the barn dance of our grandparents, but it's less hearty. It's more like a procession than a dance, for each couple follows close behind the other in a circle around the fire, or in this case, drum. On this occasion, Last Rider and I led the dance. dance. I would have been happier if there had been no tourists looking on. Whenever I ventured to glance sideways, I realised how an Indian feels who has to perform his ceremonies and rites under the eyes of mocking whites. After that, an old man whose name I didn't know made a little speech in a loud voice. He said that I was, he said that I was now a member of the Blackfoot tribe and that they were in great need of white friends. He hoped that on my return journey I would call at Washington and intercede for them that they might receive the money that was owed to them by the government. When the festival was over, Claire returned to the art colony, but rather than, go, rather than going back to her chalet there, she was invited to camp with Lone Wolf and his wife at Lower St Mary's Lake within the reservation, where they had planned to spend the summer. Last Rider and his wife lent Claire their teepee, which was decorated with green and yellow discs representing stars and a green goose painted over the entrance. Shortly after settling in, however, Claire was off again, this time taking Lone Wolf and his father, Apokone, over the border into Canada to attend the Blood Festival on their reservation. As part of her description of the journey, she says, If civilization is to be judged by its roads, then the US is great indeed. Possibly. I used to think that US civilization was represented by its plumbing, but long before I reached the northwest, I had run clean out of the plumbing area and might indeed have been in France. The most splendid roads enabled one to contact the very heart of the Rockies. Having arrived at the site of the Blood Sun, she records, One had a sensation on the Blood Reservation that the land belonged to the Indians and the Whites were there on sufferance. We even carried our Kodaks apologetically, and with reason. The Bloods, unlike the Blackfoot, do not ask for money to be photographed. The Bloods simply ask not to be photographed at all. Photographed. The blood simply asked not to be photographed at all. There is a kind of superstition that still lingers, to the effect that a reproduction of a man's face makes him vulnerable to anyone wishing to misuse it. If their demand seems to us unreasonable, 
it is because we have so little knowledge of magic. Photographs. As I pursued the dancers around the huge camp circle, Kodak in hand, two of the members detached themselves from the group and came toward me. I saw them from a distance, and the crowd, watching, knew they were coming to me. I stood riveted. First they addressed me in the language of their tribe, and then calling a frame from any more photography. After that, I didn't dare even take surreptitious snaps. Returning to the art colony after the festival, Claire stayed at Lone Wolf's camp for a month. But only artists living in the chalets provided at the colony were allowed to work with the Native American models there. She says, many of them were Native American models there. She says, many of them were glad of this chance to earn. They received 50 cents an hour for posing, brought their families, and were encamped in teepees provided for them, and well fed during their period of sojourn. While the men posed, the women made beaded moccasins and belts, bag commissioned by the artists. It feels uncomfortable reading about the relationships between artists and models, on some levels affectionate and respectful, but on others very transactional and seemingly exploitative from a modern perspective. Claire Sheridan herself was not oblivious to this tension. The bloods were full, I always felt a kind of embarrassment when I paid them. Especially this was the case with shot on both sides, the chief of the bloods, who consented to be done by me. It seemed all wrong somehow to put money in his hand. He carried his chieftainship impressively. One day I told him through an interpreter that I considered that at last drew from him a smile of appreciation. In August, Claire was invited to stay with her friends, the Tailfeather family, on the Blood Reservation. During the ensuing days, even weeks, the tail for the farm was to be an objective for many. They came from all directions in their carts or on any. They came from all directions in their carts or on horseback to see the strange phenomenon, a white woman staying with an Indian family. While staying with the tail feathers, she learned about regulations that brought misery to families on the reservation. According to government regulations, every child on the reservation from Sedin is obliged to go to either of the two boarding schools, the Anglican, which means Protestant, or the Roman Catholic. They are missionary schools, subsidised by the state. That means the church, or churches, lay hands on the whole generation of blood Indian for ten years. During those ten years they must not dance, beat a drum, or pray in the Indian way. As winter approached, Claire knew she must leave the Tailfeathers farm. They had given her one of the two rooms of their cabin and were sleeping in a tent outside, but it would soon be too cold to camp. She visited friends she had made over the summer, by tour. Whilst visiting Rough Hair and his wife, he suggested she dress up in his wife's clothes for a photograph. Esto Tailfeather had accompanied her and was asked to take photos. Claire recalls, She'd never done such a thing in her life, and she handled the Kodak as if it were a bomb that might explode. To finish off, finish off the outfit, Rough Hair decided Claire should wear his war bonnet, and gave her his eagle claw necklace. Another day she visited, shot on both sides, an ancient pipe woman, who were living in a bare, empty and sad shack. I could not help contrasting this interior with the interior of their teepee as I remembered it. Of their teepee as I remembered it. The one so repellently gloomy, the other so tastefully colourful. In the teepee at St Mary's they seemed so perfectly at home. It was, in fact, a home in every sense of the word. They gave the impression of having settled into it for life, but the house was like a waiting room. Ancient, ancient pipe woman said she had a gift for Claire and disappeared into the next room. She reappeared carrying a formidable tomahawk. A heavy stone was half covered with hide, and it had a flexible hide-covered handle. Ancient pipe woman said she had it from her father. Supposedly it dated back to pre-white man days, so she said, for pounding pemmican into a mush. I held it in my hand, fascinated by the thought that it could crack a skull the way one cracks a nut. The chief took it from me with a semi-serious air. He did not wish, he said, to be responsible for a murder. Claire didn't have to travel far to see old friends crazy by night as they were also camped outside the Tailfeather's house. Crazy Crow was old and frail, and she gave him her Hudson Bay coat to keep him warm. In return, Conquered by Night gave Claire 
an elk tooth in thanks for her kindness. Shortly before she started her journey back to England, England, Crazy Crow invited Claire to his tent as he wanted to pray over her before she set out. At the end of the prayers, he stroked her hair and touched her brow with his precious eagle feather before tying it into her hair as a gift and a blessing. In the pouring rain of a grey morning, the tail feathers were at my pouring rain of a grey morning. The tail feathers were at my hotel to see me start for England. How fantastic that sounded! The whole continent lay between me and the ocean. No one knows the gloom that was in my heart at the thought of that return journey. It is one thing to leave New York and travel steadily west, knowing that every day to leave the Rockies, and know that every day that passes is a day's march nearer New York. I broke away from them with a lump in my throat. Their last word was Kokotoza. It was the last time.